from Lloyd Best. Our ignorance about our own historical experience is a most damaging thing and needs to be corrected at once. Further delay may cost very dear. With the possible exception of Cuba, the governments of the Caribbean are bankrupt almost beyond redemption. But they have power, and it is a power they are already beginning to use destructively. We may displace these governments, of course, but what good would it serve the succeeding regimes unless we also erode the intellectual, philosophical, and psychological foundations of current politics? Unless the next generation was served with some coherent statement of Caribbean historical process. Lloyd Bess, Independent Thought and Caribbean Freedom. And the last thing I want to share is from my dear friend and mentor, or I like to say tormentor, Peter Minchel. Who am I? I am not a European. I am not an African. I am not an Indian. I am not Syrian or, or Chinese. I am not an Amerindian. I am not an American, North or South. I am none of these. I am all of these. I am a Caribbean. I am a rare hybrid. I am a richly textured, multi-layered creature. I am as precious as a pearl. The world is my oyster. I see the world clearly from my island vantage. I do not harbor the vanities of a big city dweller or someone from a vast continent. I am at the tip of the spear that leads into the future. I am a Caribbean. They say the Caribbean is a sea. Yes, I am an island in it. Much blood has spilled in that sea. All the waters of humanity wash my shores. I am a Caribbean. Peter Minchel. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome the man of the moment, Afra Raymond. Okay, Wendell, thank you. And uh, what was interesting about that is the whole idea about I am Caribbean. Because we started off, we went from uh, Lloyd, and then we went to Peter Minchel. And we're talking about trying to find a Caribbean identity. And some of this work that we're doing here is trying to explore how do we establish a Caribbean civilization. That is through a process, how we establish civilizations, through a process of trial and error. We have to try different things. Sometimes we'd succeed and sometimes we would not succeed. And we have to record what has happened on those occasions. I talked about the records the last time around. And recently I've been speaking about the importance of memory. Because Lloyd, in his, in his speech from Independent Thought and Caribbean Freedom, in his lecture from there, Lloyd talked about the bankruptcy of the regimes with the exception of Cuba. And part of the bankruptcy is the unwillingness or the fear of the record. So in fact, we have records being purposely discussed, and we did destroy them, sorry. And we went into that seriously the last time around. This time we're going to go with particularity, we're going to go into the tourism question in Trinidad and Tobago. And we're going to go into the question about large scale tourism and how it can happen or not happen in the Caribbean region with particular reference to Trinidad and Tobago. You went back to Eric Williams, Wendell. And uh, Dr. Eric Williams is the country's first premier, the country's first prime minister. And his independence speech in 1962 is actually really, really interesting reading, given what happened afterwards. But there's a paragraph towards the end of the speech in which Dr. Williams makes the, the declamation that what is really required to make our democracy come to life is an informed and a committed and an active citizenry. That is what is really required. He went on to say that in fact the members of parliament who are, who are appointed by the constitution cannot really do their work. They cannot really perform unless they are held to account by an active and an informed and an involved citizenry. Okay? And we have some of that these days. But I, I'm of the view we don't have enough of it. We also have recent views from one of the kind of recent bet noirs of the revolutionary scene, Yanis Varoufakis, who's the former finance minister of Greece, speaking about how the new civil society will take shape. And Varoufakis is speaking about the fact that 
for the civil society to take shape, everybody in the society must be able to discuss the economy with authority and with detail, if they want to. And in fact, if we get to the point that everybody could do that, because it's about information as a, as a first point and about citizens recognizing their rights, if we get to the point where everybody could do that, we have the beginnings of a fertile democracy and a fertile society. It's almost like an echo from C.L.R. James, Every Cook Can Govern, that fantastic essay from 1960 or 61 or something, Varoufakis, two months ago. And Varoufakis goes on to say, he concludes his stanza by saying, that if we leave every decision to professional economists, we in fact have given away all of our power. Okay? So professional economists have a role, they can advise, they can point out consequences, the plus and the minus, but if we leave all the decisions to them, we give away all of our power. And then I was doing some South to South reading from a professor from Pakistan called um, Professor Pervez Hootboy, who's a physicist. He's writing in a, in a journal in Pakistan called Dawn, and he's writing about the, the rise of unreason. And he's discussing a situation in Pakistan where there's a battle between faith, and in this case, he's referring to the Islamic belief system, the Islamic faith. And reason, in other words, scientific, Western logic and so on. And he's describing the consequences of following with faith and how it can actually corrode institutions and corrode decision making and you end up making decisions not on the facts because in fact if you're going on faith you're not allowed to refer to the facts. And there's a really pregnant phrase he uses where he says that, in fact, once the facts become irrelevant, anything is possible. Any decision could be justified once the facts become irrelevant. And uh, you might think, if you think about it, because Trinidad and Tobago is, is pretty much a secular kind of space. People have a lot of different religions here. They have a lot of different political tendencies. People have different lifestyles happening in the society and so on. And you might think that Pakistan is a kind of an outlandish example. What has Pakistan got to do with Trinidad and Tobago? But in fact, I have the belief that we also suffer from a schism between faith and reason. So in Trinidad and Tobago, our faith may not find expression from the fact that you are a Christian or you are a Muslim, but it would find expression from party political support. So a particular party is elected into power, and they're doing something that a normal analysis could tell you it doesn't make any sense. And we're going to be talking about that later. It literally makes no sense. They cannot justify it. But if you try to speak to people in the party in power about it, they will give you a lot of reasons. But what it all boils down to is a declaration of faith. So you get people will tell you that in fact, um, Dr. Rowley and Mr. Imbot and Faris al Rawi, they wouldn't be doing this because they're not like the last group. And people from the last group would tell you that Kamla and Anan and Mr. Dukaran wouldn't do that because they're not like the PNM. And what you're really hearing, because you're not getting any kind of answer to the questions, what you're really hearing is a declaration of faith. Eh? You're really hearing somebody saying, I believe in that, that is my icon, and I am following that. So we have to get a little bit deeper than that. And this is the reason why successive administrations obscure the record, they hide the records. As a good friend of mine, he's in the audience somewhere on his phone, as a good friend of mine always says, he says to me, Afra, we grew up in this Christian thing. And when you grow up in a Christian thing, you learn about the Ten Commandments. We all know about the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not do this and thou shalt not do that. But he said, the way we live in now in Trinidad and Tobago, we have an 11 commandment that's controlling everything. And the 11th commandment is, thou shalt not be found out. So in fact, that is, how, that is how the thing is really working at this time in terms of our records and our decision making. And it doesn't matter really whether it's Kamala Pusat Besessa or Dr. Rowley. Those people are like pieces on a chessboard. It really doesn't matter. They don't really have a personality as far as this is concerned. This is about us, who we put, who we support, and what we continue to support as we go forward, okay? Now, yeah. Now, 
what all of that is coming to is a discussion about our development. And I'm, I'm, development is the thing I like to talk about the most. It's, it's part of what I do professionally. And what does development mean? How would it manifest? And what are the good signs and the negative signs and so on? And I will start off by saying that in our country, and I'm talking about tourism, I said I would speak about tourism and hotels. The three biggest hotels in the country are owned by the state. Okay? A lot of people, when I first said that, they didn't know that. The three biggest hotels in the country are owned by the state. And it's a very unusual pattern. So we have the Trinidad Hilton that was built in 62. We have the Hyatt Regency that was built in 2008. And we have Tobago Hilton, now known as Magdalena, that was built in 2000. And together, I thought I'd call us OMS, yes, funny. But together, those, um, but together those, those three hotels account for about 1,100 rooms of the good quality rooms in the country, which is just below half the number of rooms in the country. And the model that they've used is that the government has invested to build the hotels. There's a, there's a difference in there, I'll talk about that in detail later. And the foreign companies have come in and put their badge on and operated a hotel from those premises. And the model is important because in other parts of the Caribbean, that's not the model that they use. In other parts of the Caribbean, they don't have the money to spend money to build a hotel. So they will just give the land to the foreign hotelier. They will put up the hotel at their expense and they demand tax concessions. In Trinidad and Tobago, we have specialized in certain things. And one of them is to eat your cake and have it. So in fact, what happens in Trinidad and Tobago is that we will build a hotel for the foreign hotelier and we'll give them a tax concession. So we have a Tourism Development Act. I forget the year, it might be 1995 or something. I see some people in the audience who would know. And in that, under that act, you have a seven year holiday for this and an eight year holiday for that and a 12 year holiday for the other. And recently with the Tobago Sandals proposal, Dr. Rowley has been, and Mr. Minister Stuart Young, have been saying publicly that they want to negotiate and they want to get cabinet approval to offer additional concessions to the, to the Sandals group because they want them to come here. This has been said publicly several times. So under our current situation, we build the hotels and we give a tax concession. That doesn't happen anywhere else. And I need to, to talk a little bit about Tobago Hilton. Tobago Hilton is one of those things that is like a deep, dark secret that we all know it's there, but it's seldom discussed. So Dr. Rowley spoke, I think it was two Thursdays ago, and he spoke at a meeting in Tobago of the PNM. It was reported in the, in the Guardian on the Saturday, and the article was um, Tobago Talks. It's a little pull out the Guardian has. And uh, it was on the 3rd of, 3rd of December, 3rd of November. And uh, in that article, Dr. Rowley thanked the PNM in Tobago for voting in support of Tobago Sandals. And he cited Trinidad Hilton as a success where the government had built a hotel and a foreign company had come. And he cited Hyatt Regency as a success. The government had built a hotel and the foreigners had come. And it's very interesting that he was speaking to the PNM in Tobago about a hotel proposal in Tobago. And he was completely silent about the Tobago Hilton. You see? So it's like a little lacuna. Where they have a gap, the gap has a meaning. And then if you look at the gap now, you see the real meaning of it. Let's talk about Tobago Hilton. It's now known as Magdalena Grand. And what's interesting about the Tobago Hilton is that it's the first time in this country that we try to build a major resort hotel in which the government was a, was a significant participant. It never happened before. It's also in Tobago. So it's got a lot of, as far as I'm concerned, possible lessons learned for what's about to happen with Sandals. So the, pro the project was put together under a company called Vanguard. And Vanguard it was 47% owned by the state. And about 30% owned by two companies. One was Angostura, who were the developers of Tobago Plantations. And the other one was Guardian Life. And Hilton International had about 20% of shares. 
And those three, those three groups, the government, the two private sector people in Hilton, got together and borrowed money on the New York Stock Exchange, they call it Wall Street. They borrowed about 17 million US dollars to build the hotel. There were problems with the design and the construction. The thing was not well maintained. And they borrowed the money for 10 years. And six years after the hotel opened, it opened in 2000, six years after it opened, it was put up for sale because it could not pay its bills. So, we have what is a, co a commercial failure. It has to be looked at like a test case. Six years in 2006, it had been put up for sale by a company out of Miami. They were asking 139 million for it, which is just more than what they paid for, for the land and the building. They never got any offers, and then an interesting thing took place. You see, we talk about the bailout with Clico, and we talk about the bailout with Clico like it's a unique thing, and it has important lessons, but as I went through the experience of researching the bailout on Clico, I started asking myself the question whether this is the first time. Because what Dr. Rowley said, and it's very, very interesting, eh? there's a kind of echo in history. It's very, very interesting because at the time, he was Minister of Trade and Industry. He was appointed in November of 2007, and he was fired in, October, in April of 2008. So just really for about four months, he was there. Five months. And in that period, on one of those days, the 27th of March of 2008, Dr. Rowley gave the main presentation at a post-cabinet briefing. And at that presentation, Dr. Rowley explained a number of things. He explained that the hotel had busted, because it had closed two months before. This is Tobago Hilton. And of course, just to explain the line of command, as Minister of Trade and Industry, ETEC was part of his ministry, and ETEC is the commercial partner to Hilton in the Vanguard Agreement. So he explained the hotel has failed. He explained that the government is going to be buying out, which means bailing out, Guardian Life and Angostura. He explained that Hilton was actually giving back their shares, because Hilton had signed a contract for 20 years to manage the hotel, and I think an option to renew for a further 30 years. So we thought at the beginning Hilton was here for 50 years. They were able to hand back the keys. All of this is 27th of March, 2008, at the post-cabinet briefing. And then Rowley went further, because he's a very forthright speaker. He went further, and he spent a lot of time explaining that the private sector partners, remember the names, Angus Tura and Guardian Life, had not been paying their part of the repair and maintenance bill which is why the building had deteriorated so quickly. Of course, it, part of it was the design and the construction. And that in fact, this is what had caused the whole business unit to shrink and the number of bookings had reduced and so on and so on. Now the government at the time, which is Mr. Patrick Manning, took $45 million of our money to repair the building. And I want you to work with me. Mrs. Kamla Pasad Besessa, and her team won the election in 2010, May. And Mr. Stephen Cadiz is the Minister of Trade and Industry. And Mr. Cadiz had the same portfolio as Dr. Rowley had. And they spent 388 million to fix the building again. So a building that cost 140 million to build, 45 million to fix, and 388 million to fix again. That's one building. And at the same time, it had collapsed. You're connected with the international group, which is, which is Hilton International. And it collapsed within six months, within six years, it collapsed. Why did it collapse? As I said at the time, because I was writing about it in, in March and April of 08, at the time I was writing about it while it was happening. As I said at the time, we need to do a proper study of this. There's no point us having a business school. I think it's the Arthur Lockjack Graduate School of Business and an economics department at UWE, and a finance department, and political science and engineering. If we can't study, to go back to the question of how you build a civilization, if we can't study the trials and the errors and the failures and the successes and figure out what exactly went wrong. Because if we don't know what went wrong with Tobago Hilton, and I have, I have checked, because I've asked, I've asked the people in trade and industry, I've asked people at UE, I've asked, have you all studied this? Is there a study? Is there a review? There isn't a review. 
because nobody's interested in reviewing anything. That's what Lloyd was talking about when Lloyd said the, society, the, the governments are bankrupt, except for possibly Cuba. Because that's what bankruptcy is. When you run into a big crash, and you scramble some things and you dive out. And what you get out with, you get out with. And what you don't get out with, you don't get out with. And I have a hashtag I use over and over. Hashtag morals of a mango thief. That's the morals of a mango thief. So you never stop to really study anything. You just scramble on to the next episode. And then we come to the current situation where in fact we have a Sanders mega resort being proposed. And I say mega because the figure that's been mentioned the most is 750 rooms. And to give you an idea of what 750 rooms is, the biggest hotel in Tobago is the same Tobago Hilton, which has only got 198 rooms. So the Sanders is being proposed is three and a half times bigger than the Tobago Hilton. Okay? So we're talking about a really immense investment in terms of bricks and mortar and water and electricity and so on. But I want to stop here and describe some research I have been doing because I've been doing some research to try to excavate some details to understand what has happened. We have a situation where we have three hugest hotels in the country owned by the state. And we don't have any details of them as far as what I've, the phrase I have, I'm using is the underlying commercial arrangements. We don't know what the arrangements are. So we know about the hotels. When I said the names just now, you all knew the names. Do we know how much money Trinidad Hilton made last year? Do we know how much money Magdalena made in 2015? Do we understand what proportion of that came to Trinidad and Tobago government? Was it the same figure that was supposed to come to them? That's in the agreement. Is the agreement being conformed with? We literally don't know. And to give you a proportional idea of what it is I'm talking about, because I have some information. It's not information I can always quote, but I will mention something. The Hyatt Regency down at Wrightson Road, there, Dock Road, cost $508 million to build when it was finished at the end of 07. And they just finished a refurbishment for $122 million. So it's $630 million altogether in capital costs to design, build, fit, and furnish. I got a figure from somebody inside of Hyatt that in the first 10 months of 2016, Hyatt's turnover was about 600 million TT dollars. So the point is that we in Trinidad and Tobago, and by we, I don't, I'm just talking about me and you, I'm talking about the journalists, the politicians, the trade unionists, we appear to be stuck where we're still discussing the capital cost of the project. So the building is 100 million, the building is 200 million. But the actual vast amount of money that is being made by the operating hotel, we are completely silent on it. The Joint Select Committees of Parliament never talk about it. It's like they have a consensus not to talk about the thing that really matters. And you need to get, be quite clear on that. For those of you who might be looking and wondering whether this is an anti-PNM thing, it's not anti-PNM because UNC wouldn't do any different. They wouldn't. They wouldn't approach the thing and discuss the underlying commercial arrangements. Those things are secret because that is where the money really, really flows. The huge amount of money. Now, I sat down and thought about all this when Dr. Rowley announced the hotel and so. And I started constructing a research program, designing a research program to find out what was happening with the hotels. So, just to give you a little background, my own profession is valuation. And part of the valuation profession is to value hotels. And hotels are considered to be trading properties, like gas stations, like restaurants, like marinas, like pubs. And there's an approach we use to value those, and we use the accounts. And you're trained into how to use the accounts to prepare valuation. So I had a little bit of background. So what I prepared was a research program that went like this. So these are the things I wanted to know. The first thing I wanted to know was, what is actually the agreement that the government of Trinidad and Tobago or its agency has with the hotel operator? So I want a copy of that agreement. The second thing I want to know is, how much money the hotel makes? 
the gross turnover year by year by year. The third thing was, what is the proportion that the government, is, that the state is supposed to earn? The fourth thing is, what is the proportion that the state did earn? Because it's not necessarily the same thing. The other questions related to the repairs and maintenance. How are repairs and maintenance accounted for? Is money set aside? And then the reserve is used to repair? Or is it that no money is set aside? And when repairs have to be done, we, the people of Trinidad and Tobago, have to pay for everything. Then there's also the HR aspect, because it's a human resource aspect to the thing. Question being whether, in fact, there are programs to appoint and promote and train managers and supervisors and staff in those hotels so they can move through the organization and improve themselves and so on. As part of national development, human resource development is part of national development. And of course, there were also reports that some of the hotels have been playing games with their taxes. So I constructed a program of research that went across four organizations. So the four organizations were ETEC, which is the state agency, the state enterprise that has the relationship with Trinidad Hilton and with Tobago Hilton, now known as Magdalena. The next organization I went to was Udicott. And Udicott has the relationship. Yeah. Udicott has a relationship with um, Hyatt Regency. And the third organization I went to, which is really interesting because we had this report from reliable sources that some of these hotels, the big international ones, had not been discharging their obligations where taxes are concerned. So we went to the Board of Inland Revenue. And we asked the Board of Inland Revenue a very particular question, we asked them whether these hotels had actually paid all the taxes that were due, whether they'd ever had an investigation, whether they'd ever been fined, whether they'd ever paid any penalty, whether they had any pending cases, and we made it clear that we weren't asking for any amounts of money. We just wanted to know, were they conforming or not? And the fourth organization we went to was the Ministry of Finance, because the Ministry of Finance is what we call Corporation Soul. And the Ministry of Finance, who, as corporation sole, holds all the shares in Unicot, and they hold all the shares in ETEC. And the question to them was, have you ever done a financial audit of these hotels? Or have you ever done a management review of the hotels? And what came about was really, really astonishing and surprising. Because, I'm just saying that with my tongue in my cheek because I'm not really surprised. Because what really happened is that they refused to answer. So we have, we have a situation where ETEC wrote us a one-line letter, what we call a one-line letter, two lines, to say, listen, we reviewed this request, because our request was long and detailed. We reviewed this request, and we can't tell you anything because of commercial confidentiality. And there are clauses in this Freedom of Information Act where you can deny a request. We wrote back to ETEC, and I have to say that I have to pause here and give thanks to my colleagues because I didn't do this on my own. The people who helped me to do it were the NGO called Disclosure Today. Disclosure Today was founded by Margaret Rose. She's working with Justin Phelps. Rishi Maharaj, who appeared with us at UWE last Thursday, is the CEO. Rishi is not here this evening. And they're doing marvelous work. It's really important work Disclosure Today is doing. So if any of you have things you really, really want to know, but you don't necessarily want your name to be on an application. Disclosure today will actually operate and put the application for you, put it persuasively and advance the case without you being identified. What in these spy movies they call a cutout. <laughs> so the point is that Disclosure today got back this refusal from ETEC and we had to write them again and tell them that that's not on, you can't refuse. You cannot just refuse because it's confidential. That's not a ground for refusal in the Freedom of Information Act. We had to take them on. And eventually, we got into a longer and a longer and a longer correspondence. Some features are interesting. But it got to the point now where we've actually issued a pre-action protocol. And likely is we're going to court against them. 
because they have now, we've now drawn them into a discussion now for nine months. And they are now not in a very strong position to resist our case. One of the interesting things that came out in the E-Tech correspondence was this. I mentioned earlier on that I asked about the HR angle. How are human resources developed? How are people trained? How are they retained? How are they promoted within the hotels? Management, supervisors, normal staff, and so on. And uh, ETEC actually told us that the agreement with Hilton had clauses for all of that. So there were clauses for this and for that and for retention, and they had the right to review certain appointments. And it was very interesting. This is one of the few questions they answered. And then the next question we ask in our list of questions is, can you tell us how those provisions were performed? In other words, how many people were promoted, how many people were trained, and so on and so on. And they wrote back and said, we don't understand that question. So we really didn't even kind of an unreal attitude to information and to development. With Udicott, we got a different scenario. Udicott took us down a road where they tried to get us involved in a discussion. I see Novak at the back smiling. They tried to get us in a discussion about the difference between a document and information. So in fact, it was a Freedom of Information Act. We were asking them for a document. And document doesn't have the same meaning as information. And tried to take us down a particular road. But we, we took on that and we destroyed that. That, that, was, that was just a kind of a, a small barrier. We destroyed that. And uh, Udicott has also taken up a position where they don't want to discuss what is happening at higher regency in terms of numbers. Because we'd like to get the numbers. And there's some numbers on Udicott's website. I, I should put some of them up on the screen at UWE. There's some numbers at, at um, uh, Mr. Mr. Noel Garcia's testimony in, in the Joint Select Committee. There's some numbers there. There's, a, there's a, a report of the Joint Select Committee on the Parliament website now. It has numbers and so on. But they're not detailed numbers. And they're certainly not numbers that the other side would consider satisfactory. The point is that numbers are being generated. Hyatt Regency is not going to stay in Trinidad and Tobago based on anything on a copybook page. They have proper numbers. The only person who doesn't have proper numbers is us. Let's be really clear about that. Hilton is not going to stay in Trinidad for 55 years with no numbers. They have numbers and the numbers are good in their favor. We just don't know what our numbers are. Let's be really clear what it is. In fact, the fourth person who answered us is really interesting was the Ministry of Finance. And the Ministry of Finance wrote back and asked and said to us that they had never, which is really shocking, it was clear, it was a prompt reply, it was a clear reply. You can't give them wrong for that. But it was shocking. They basically said that they had never done a financial audit of any of the hotels. And they had never done a management review of any of the hotels. Now, that is really disgusting. It's prompt and it's unambiguous, but it's really disgusting because you're talking about nearly $2 billion of our money invested in a sector. And nobody, apart from myself and my colleagues at Disclosure today, appears to be bothered about how is it performing. So you have a whole Ministry of Finance and a whole corporation so that nobody's bothered. Nobody has even asked for it or they have a, a draft, there's nothing. That is unacceptable. And it takes us right to the point of discussing the Sandals proposal. You see? So the Sandals proposal is being put about now. And I'm, I'm going to go back to Dr. Rowley's most recent statement. The one that was published on Friday, the 3rd of November. And in which he was speaking about the structure of the deal. So the structure of the deal was the two private sector conglomerates, I think it was um, Guardian and Massey, are going to put their capital in to build the hotel. And the hotel will then be leased by the government. And uh, Sanders Resorts will run their hotel out of the, out of the premises on a, on a management agreement. And Dr. Rowley was making the point about Trinidad, Hilton, and Hyatt, and what is wrong with that. Well, I mean, the first thing that strikes me, and we don't have any figures, apart from that broad thing, we don't have any figures, but the first thing that strikes me 
is that we appear to be getting back into a relationship with Guardian, which in 2008, March 27, remember the date? <laughs> We're trying to get the tape. 2008, March 27, Dr. Rory was very clear and he was very strong that the Guardian group did not meet their responsibilities, which is the reason the thing fell into crisis, which is the reason people stopped going to the hotel, which is the reason the revenue of the hotel fell, which is the reason Tobago Hilton that we put up for sale. So we're going back into another large-scale hotel investment, larger than the one before, in Tobago, and one of the people we're going to dance with is Guardian. So there's a whole question about are we willing to learn and are there any safeguards? One is not saying you should never dance with Guardian again because life is not like that. But are there any safeguards that we put in place to stop what happened before happening again? Are there any penalties? How do the penalties work? Are the penalties only on paper? And so on and so on. There's also the question that we don't know how the whole arrangement is going to work in terms of the costs to the country and the benefits. The costs to the country are immense. There was a report, a false report, they call it false news now, about April this year, that said that Sanders was trying to sell out the group to a, through a German bank called Deutsche Bank. And the CEO of Sanders, Adam Stewart, gave an interview where he attempted to rebut, rebut some of those claims. And Stewart's interview might have been in Bloom, Bloomberg and Forbes and some of those financial papers. And one of the things he said, he was going through the list of projects they have to do. And he was talking about the fact that the next projects they're going to do are so big, the Caribbean banks can't lend them the money. So they had to go to Deutsche Bank. And in fact, one of the projects is, is Tobago Sandals, which was supposed to cost 500 million US. Now, 500 million US is about three and a half billion Trinidad and Tobago dollars. Three to three and a half billion, according to how you're counting. And it's important to realize this, the size of money we're talking about. So that's the kind of money that could be invested by Neil and Massey and by uh, Guardian. Guardian Life, right? Could, it could be invested by them. And let's understand how it works. They are going to be repaid in a rent from our taxpayers' dollars. It, it's what they call a bolt. So it's build, own, lease, transfer. They will be paid. They're not going to just build that out of any charity or any goodwill. They will be paid. They will also get serious tax credits under the same Tourism Development Act. They have serious tax credits that will flow into their accounts and reduce the country's revenue in other important ways. So we need to do a cost-benefit analysis of what all of this has cost to the country. Because outside of the immediate deal of that piece of land at no man's land, Golden Grove, and the, and the $500 million cost, there are other costs. So for example, Tobago has a chronic problem in its water supply. Sanders is not going to come to Tobago for anybody to turn on the shower at 1 o'clock in the morning and they have no water. Sanders is not putting up with that. They're going to want a proper, uninterruptible water supply of water at a certain quality of purity and so on, a certain quantity of water. So a major desalination plant has to be built in Tobago. It's already being studied now. They're not talking about it, but it's already being studied now. Who is paying for that? We have to pay for that. A major improvement in Tobago's electricity supply has to happen for a resort of that size to have power uninterruptible again. And lastly, the airport, the actual terminus at, at Crown Point Airport, Arthur Napoleon Robinson Airport, has to be vastly improved. <coughs> Pardon me. All of those costs come out of our account. And the question has to arise, because I heard Mr. Gervais Warner, Gervais is the CEO of Massey Group. I heard Mr. Gervais Warner give a very enthusiastic support to the Sandals project and, and the benefits it will bring to the country and the kind of foreign investment that could arise from it and so on. And I don't know, because when I think about Sandals, if you go on the Sandals website, firstly, if you're booking to go to Sandals, the booking is not taking place in Trinidad and Tobago. It's some external place in the virtual world. That's where the money is going, off your credit card. And secondly, 
One of the interesting catchphrases they have on their website is leave your wallet at home. It's really interesting. So they say once you pay for Sandals holiday, you don't have to worry with your wallet. Just leave your wallet at home. Of course, it's just a catchphrase. You travel with your wallet because of the thing, but it's a catchphrase. You don't have to spend any more money once you've spent this money. So I don't know how Trinidad and Tobago is going to benefit, apart from small time things. So some people may get a, a chance to perform some kind of limbo or steel band or some, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and I like my limbo and my steel band. Eh? Anybody who knows me know I like my limbo and my steel band. It's just really like, that's what it is. It can't be, it can't, it can't be anything else. So, you, you have to pause and ask yourself, what are we really being sold? And, and the other thing I want to mention, I'm coming down to the end, I'm going to wrap up and we'll take, have a discussion and so. The other thing I want to mention before I wrap is that there was actually a lot of work done 15 to 20 years ago on what are the appropriate tourism models for Trinidad and Tobago. There was a lot of work done on it. And a lot of research so qualified people went through the Caribbean and did research and compared this with that and I'm not a tourism expert, there are people here who are, okay? I, I, have, I have a strength in some other areas. And what I am told by people who know, people who are in charge of that research, who are not here tonight, what I am told is that in fact the results, in other words the findings as to what Trinidad and Tobago should pursue as a tourism product and as a tourism approach is quite different to what is now being discussed, which is the Sandals all-inclusive model where you never leave the resort and you, you know, that kind of thing. It's quite a different approach was being discussed. So the point, once again, we return to that question about building a civilization and what is the importance of the record. Because we spent money to pay people to do that research. I haven't, I mean, there have been some changes, like you have Airbnb and you have different things that didn't exist 15 years ago. But I haven't seen anything that substantively it invalidates those things, those, those approaches that were taken. Yet we appear to have buried those, because you can't get any discussion about them. Eh? If you listen to the Prime Minister, what's his name? Um, Minister Stuart Young, the Minister of Tourism, Shamfaka Joe, if you listen to those people, none of them talking about any different approach. Eh? It's like a road march. So your band want to win road march, that's the only song that they sing. So the national discussion, to go back to Eric Williams' statement, has to be here at the level of an informed and active citizenry. Because the national discussion will not be found in the parliament. Dr. Munilal is not going to bring up a fresh point. Dr. Rowley is not going to bring up a fresh point. They are on one point over and over. It's like a road march competition. Our need at this point, is to continue. We are continuing our work with the support of my colleagues from Disclosure. We're continuing our work and we will continue to press. It, I, I, I would say, without meaning to be biased about it, I would say we have an irresistible case to get that information. We need to get the information out so we can have a proper appraisal of what has happened in the country where tourism is concerned. Because as I said earlier on with Hyatt, if a hotel that costs 600 million could make 600 million in 10 months, the quantity of money we're discussing is billions upon billions upon billions of dollars that have never been accounted for, they've never been discussed. We don't know if the proper taxes have been paid. The hotel, if the government people don't even know if the HR agreements have been enforced, they don't even understand what that really is. So we need to get our hands around this issue if we, need, if we mean to take tourism and hotel development and that large scale diversification to the next level. Okay, it can't happen in a vacuum. And some of the other political forces, I see some, some other political forces here. Now I'm gonna go call their names. <laughs> but some of the other political forces, those are the terms you all need to start talking about this in. Okay? What is the case you're making? Are you making a business case? Or are you making a non-business case? Are you making a case about social development? In which case is about, I made a joke just now about limbo and steel band. That's what it's about. 
because we cannot be spending these vast amounts of money. As I said, it's three and a half billion dollars that we barely have. We can't be spending these vast amounts of money behind we don't know what and we don't know why. And we're not sure. Because if you listen to Minister Stuart Young, Minister Stuart Young is like one of the new ones that they brought out. Uh, I think in September of 2015, they brought him out. And uh, Minister Young was speaking with the Port of Spain Rotary on the 15th of August this year. They had him for lunch and he was a keynote speaker. And Minister Young was speaking. And he was at pains. He's an eloquent speaker. He's a straightforward, eloquent speaker. He was at pains. But it's interesting when you're a straightforward, eloquent speaker and you have a funny script. It's real interesting. So Young made the point that in fact, and he said it at the beginning, like a headline, this government has nothing to hide. We're committed to transparency. We're committed to accountability. We're committed to good governance, not like the last lot. And, we, and he's talking about sandals. Eh? And we're going to be doing sandals, and this is, the, this is the fashion we're going to do it in, and so on and so on. And of course, what is echoing in my mind, because things echo in my mind, is the fact you don't want to tell me anything about hotel number one, Trinidad Hilton. You don't want to tell me anything about hotel number two, Tobago Hilton. You don't want to tell me anything about hotel number three, Hyatt Regency. But I must trust you, because you're going to be open and transparent about the fourth one. This is the kind of bad script that they gave the boy to read. It's a bad script. But then he goes on, and this is where he really compounds it. He goes on and he says, well, we don't know what we could reveal because all these things have a confidentiality clause. And it's according to what the confidentiality clause says, what we would be allowed to tell the public. So understand, take it, eh? The private is a public-private partnership. Those, those, those agreements have been described in a public-private partnership. That's the latest flavor, so follow this. Eh? The public-private partnership, its, its details are being defined by the minister in the office of the prime minister and the minister in the office of the attorney general, Minister Stuart Young. They're being defined by Stuart as the private sector will tell the state what they can tell the citizens. That's what it is we dealing with right now. So we talk about freedom of information, and then on the other hand, we have incarceration of information. The private sector will tell the state what they could tell the citizens. And I don't think that's acceptable. In fact, it's completely incompatible with the opening statement about you being good governance and accountability and transparency. It's incompatible at all, in total sense. We're going to continue with the work. I'm going to pause here. I need another sip of water, and I'll turn over to you all so you all can discuss with me.